It's one of the most profound questions in the universe. Are we alone? We just don't have enough information to know. But we spoke to someone who has some ideas about how and when we might find out. We are so excited to talk to Lisa Kaltenegger. She is the director of the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell and an associate professor of astronomy. Welcome and thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks for having me. So you study exoplanets, which are planets orbiting other stars. And what's so fascinating about them to me is that 30 years ago, we really didn't know that they existed. We had never directly observed them. And in a period of just a couple decades, now we have detected thousands of them. There was always this curiosity that people we were wondering whether we alone in the cosmos. And for the first time in human history, we have the technical tools to actually figure it out. And now, next year, we will launch the James Webb Space Telescope that for the first time, we'll be able to collect enough light from these tiny, tiny planets like in Earth. So we could look for signs of life in its atmosphere. Are you optimistic that we might actually find signs of life? I think the numbers are forever in our favor because as I said, we have 200 billion stars. So next time you go out to the sky and just count one, two, three, four, five, one out of five stars has a planet that could be like the Earth, then I'll like our odds. And you know, you get to with this very back of the envelope calculation to billions of billions of potential Earth. How do scientists even find these planets in the first place. The really interesting thing, if you think about it in detail, is that we haven't seen most of these planets at all. But what we Mm -hmm. see is their effect on their host star. And the second method that we keep using is you have a star, it's nice and bright because it's hot. But then just once in a while, if a planet that orbits it goes from our point of view through our line of sight to that star, the star becomes a tiny bit less bright. So you can say we see the shadow of a planet. And so it's kind of really cool that most planets that we found, of these 4,000s that we already discovered around other stars, we have not seen. Now we're kind of transitioning into a time where we can characterize exoplanets more as opposed to just detecting them. Could you talk a little bit about what the difference is between a characterization of an exoplanet and following up on those detections as opposed to just uh, finding that one is there? That's why we're building this big telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope that's supposed to be launching next year. Fingers crossed, Halloween. (laughs) <laughs> and big telescopes on the ground, 40 meter telescopes in Chile to do the same thing, stare at these tiny, tiny worlds, but we need to get enough light from these objects, from this tiny atmosphere, to be able to tell what's in it, what the chemical makeup is, and whether or not there's signs that we can't explain any other way, but there being life. Well, what kind of signs might those be? That's tantalizing. There we go back to The only place where we know that there's life is our own Earth. So what we're using here is actually our Earth as the key. And the key, when you look at the Earth, and that's what we did, that for example, what Sagan did in 93, looking back at the Earth. So Carl Sagan looked back at the Earth and he was like, well, what do you say that would indicate that there's life on our planet? And that's what we're looking for. And we're looking for everything that's kind of really weird and not explainable too, just to keep our options open to say, hmm, what kind of life could that be? But that's going to be so much harder. Even the first one, finding gases like in Earth's atmosphere that indicate life are going to be incredibly hard and challenging. So this is going to be at the verge of technical possibility. But it's a possibility. Have there been any candidates that are like, ooh, we should really look at those guys a little bit closer, these worlds? Well, we'll have the telescopes that can do it. And then the question is, is life everywhere it can be? Or is it on every hundredth planet, every tenth planet, every thousandth planet? Who knows? That's in a way what also makes it so exciting. I'd rather have it everywhere because that's going to be much easier. (laughs) But uh, we'll know. We'll know soon if it's common in the universe or not, because if it's common, then we should be able to find it with James Webb and the extremely large telescopes. If we're assuming it's a life that's similar to us, that we would have like some familiar biosignatures that we could recognize, a planet would need to be sort of in that habitable zone where liquid water could exist. But what about the star system itself? Are there types of stars or systems that might be more likely to be habitable than others? 
And so that's a big discussion that's going on. Are there other are there systems that are better or worse, right? But whether or not it has life is completely open for all of them. Mm -hmm. And so you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, it has to be a yellow sun. And then what is that based on? Well, we have a yellow sun, right? And remember humanity thought the earth was in the center of the universe and everything was around us. Then we figured out the sun, but like we were rotating around the sun. And then we figured out not even the sun was in the center of the universe. So, you know, it was a lot of letdowns. And so now sometimes I kind of get the feeling it's like, oh, no, no, no. It has to be a yellow sun and it has to be one moon, right? And it's just basically because we have a yellow sun and we have a moon. We have to be very careful not to be too earth centric in our search by saying, oh, this planet is better than the other because we really don't know yet. All of them are good until proven otherwise. I love it. Keeping an open mind when it comes to the galaxy. It reminds me of one of your studies that I, I found super fascinating, which is this idea that even a star that had gone supernova might actually, there might be planets around a star like that, that survive that and have a kind of second genesis of life possibly. It's such an interesting idea. It makes me want to write a million sci-fi spec scripts. Could you talk a little bit more about that possibility of a survivor planet? When stars are born, then they mature, you know, and then at the end, they throw out part of the outer layers. And so the idea was that after that, there is no planet that can survive that. That was just like the common idea. But last month we published this paper where we found the first giant planets, or something like Jupiter or Saturn, around one of the stellar remnants, the dead stellar cores that we call a white dwarf. And so if a big thing can survive around one of these dead stars, dead star remnants, then probably smaller things like the Earth, small rocks, have an even easier time surviving around it. And so then the question that I find fascinating is to ask, so if you had such a rock there, right? So we found the first big planet, so then it's not such a big step to say, maybe there's a smaller one out there too, but what would happen there? If we could find signs of life, would it be signs of life that started again after the star exploded? And then the really fascinating thing for me is that that basically tells you about the tenacity of life, right? But if we found signs of life, wouldn't that be profound for the future of the universe? Lisa, I'd really love to know a little bit more about Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell. What's the Institute's mission and, and, and what kind of work do you guys do? So when I came to Cornell, one of the reasons was that Carl Sagan was here and already put together this interdisciplinary idea that, you know, planetary science should work with astronomy, should work with biology. But that's been a while ago. So when I came here, I found that the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell to put together that forensic toolkit to find life in the solar system and outside of it. And so currently we're about 35 professors and researchers and then lots of postdocs and students and undergrads trying to do that from 15 different departments. So we have astronomy, earth and atmospheric science, engineering, biology, music, science communication, like a potpourri of ideas and viewpoints that I think is vital to actually address this huge, huge question of whether we're alone in the cosmos. It's so exciting and such a great extension of Carl Sagan's legacy. I first got interested in science because of the Cosmos show from 1980. And so I think his special brand of science communication continues to just inspire. And it's really cool to know that Cornell has the Institute. One of the things that was actually really interesting. So my office is actually Carl Sagan's old office. And oh, so when, nice. I moved, when I moved into my office, I was like, I'm just going to stand here and see if by osmosis, they're like really good ideas <laughs> that are going to come here. But it's kind of really great because I watch outside my window and I'm like, so this is where he was sitting and was musing about the universe. One of his most uh, long lasting kind of uh, popular works I, that I of course have. Everybody loves Contact, right? Both the novel, the movie have mean a lot to people. And it's a very interesting conception of how first contact might work. This morning's detection of an unidentified radio source from deep space can neither be confirmed nor denied. Whatever it is, it ain't local. I love Contact, the movie uh, and the, the book and the movie. I think one of my favorite scenes is actually when they get the contact, right? When they get the signal. And then the other, she's like, so who are we going to tell next? And she's like, 
everyone. And then you see the military <laughs> helicopter coming in and closing the whole thing down, right? Because this is the scientific point of view, right? It's like, oh, we found something. Let's tell everyone so everybody can help and everybody can like take part in it. But I think where we have actually progressed a lot is that in that book, he talks about, and that's true, right? It would be this this inherent fear that people could have about such a discovery. But it's completely different now, I think, because we have found planets around other stars. We found small enough planets around other stars that they could be another Earth. And so the next step will be trying to find signs of life in the atmosphere. I think one of the other movies that I really like recently that came out was Arrival. Because this idea that, that any message, if we ever got one, would actually be in plain English or in a code we can easily crack, right? Now that's a proper introduction. I think just trying to communicate with a species on our own planet, right? Trying to talk to a jellyfish. We will have to learn a lot about how to communicate. And so I think communication, if there ever is a message that comes and that we can decipher, will be a huge field and trying to not misunderstand, right? Just think about when you're on the phone with somebody and you misunderstand the tone or something they said, right? And you're like, oh my God, you know, what did they think? So we'll have to dread really carefully in this kind of things if there's ever real communication. But I think it's more likely that we're going to find these signs of life in the atmosphere of another planet. And then we can figure out what we want to do. But if you take our solar system, all the planets in the sun, and shrink it to the size of a cookie, the next star over is in the same scale, two football fields away for <laughs> four light years. So you really don't have to worry. I think that's what a lot of people are like, oh God, they're going to come and eat us. I'm like, well, wait, why would they eat us, right? It's just like, I'm like, if you're so advanced that you actually be able to do space flight, you know, they're like, oh, they're going to come and make us slaves. I'm like, really? They're not going to be able to build robots if they have space flight, right? So I think some of our ideas might be a little bit influenced by very good and very fun, you know, Hollywood movies or even independent movies about what's going to happen. I think this worry about whether or not we should announce ourselves is kind of, let's say, old-fashioned. Mm. Because if they had the same technology that we have, they would be able to find signs of life, oxygen with methane or ozone with methane in, and water in our atmosphere. They would have found it for about two billion years. Mm. So, you know, whether or not we now say hi is probably a mute point at this point. And so we've identified about a thousand stars within only about 300 light years that would see the Earth block light from its sun and so could read this light that gets filtered through the atmosphere of our own planet and find its vibrant biosphere. If somebody is out there, who knows? If somebody looked, who knows? If somebody found us, who knows? This is what, to me, makes it so interesting to look because it's our first foray, in a way, into this search and into our position in the cosmos. And one other thing we'll learn from this, even if you don't care about life in the universe, is actually how an Earth-like planet works and how it evolves into the future. And so we learn about our pale blue dot by studying these other pale blue dots and learning hopefully how to take best care of our own planet.